Hello and welcome to Train Signal. You are watching Security Administration. Back during my early days as a network administrator, security wasn't the concern that it is today. Many will place the blame for most security threats right at the doorstop of the Internet. And while a significant portion of threats do emanate from the web, there are also internal risks that shouldn't be overlooked. A scan of the news headlines on any given day will detail all the things that could and do go wrong on networks that have been exploited. There are annoyances like spam that can still harbor malicious software. Then you have data breaches that could cause a loss of intellectual capital or even customer information. Talk to anyone who's had responsibility for security at their organization and you'll probably hear some interesting tales. I'll share one of my own. At one organization, I was trying to implement a corporate headquarters mandated password policy. I held a meeting explaining the new policy, part of which included periodic password changes. I talked, I explained, I answered questions, and left the meeting feeling that things had gone relatively smoothly. Only afterwards, an executive approached me, informing me they essentially wouldn't comply with the new policy because said executive felt that there was nothing of interest on their computer that should require such rigorous controls. Does this story sound familiar to you? I bet you heard some variation or another of what is an all too common theme. Now some of these battles you'll win and some you may lose, but I'd like to think that with the media focus on security today, these occurrences are becoming less and less common. A question that plagues administrators around the world is how do I best secure my network and systems? The answer of course will differ depending on your operating system. Linux has tools, techniques, and best practices to help secure your servers and hosts. So in this lesson, we'll talk about the Linux Super Server, a tool used to help provide another layer of insulation and protection for your network. We'll move on to unused servers that may be running on your network and the security risks they pose. Then we'll talk about configuration files and how they can be used to track down unnecessary servers. We'll close things out with a look at security for the computers or hosts on your network. Let's start off with the super server on the next slide. Before we talk about the super server, let's take a moment to talk about security in general. This is arguably one of the most important job duties of a network administrator. Sure, you may have to install, configure, and manage systems and servers. You might also perform software and hardware upgrades. And of course, you have to troubleshoot and solve network issues. But the underlying issue, the concept that you must think about at each layer of your network, is security. And this is a subject that Linux Plus takes seriously. A concept that I learned early on about security was called defense in depth. This is another way of saying that you should have a multi-layered approach to security. There are the simple things at what could be a first layer. Things like physical access control. That's making sure that your data center or server rooms are secure or giving mobile employees locks for their laptops. At the next layer could be firewalls or other security hardware technologies. Then there's patches. As you know many exploits occur from known software vulnerabilities so ensuring that you have the most updated software helps to minimize this threat. You should also have a plan for permissions and resource access rights. For instance developing a password policy like we just discussed and should also take a proactive approach to security monitoring. Read up on the latest security threats and use the best tools to help monitor your network traffic. Okay, now let's move on to talk about the super server. Typically network server programs open a port when the system boots up and listens for a connection. But some programs have a go-between. That go-between is called the super server. This program listens for network connections on behalf of another program and then hands off control to the intended server. This scenario has a couple really important benefits. First off, it reduces memory. When a request for a network service comes through the super server, it processes the request, starts the daemon for the requested service, and forwards the request onto that server. Once that request is completed and the network service isn't needed any longer, the super server unloads the daemon from memory. The other benefit is the security one. The super server can add security checks that apply to all servers that it manages. 
Typical examples of network services managed by the super server might include SMTP or POP3. The two types of super servers are INETD and XINETD. Let's take a look at INETD on the next slide. INETD used to be the default super server and may in fact still be on your system, but many distributions have turned to the inherently more secure XINETD, which we'll discuss in just a moment. To see if INETD is on your system, you can use the grep command that we've used a few times already. The syntax is ps space ax space pipe space grep space inetd. So the next question is, how do you add servers to inetd? You do so through its configuration file, which you've probably guessed is stored in the Etsy directory. The name of the file is inetd.conf. The format for this file has one line for each server with the following fields. The first is service name, and that's the service name as it appears in the Etsy services directory. Next we have socket type, which is the type of connection, and that could be stream, dgram, or raw. The next field is protocol, which is either TCP or UDP. Then we have wait, no wait, which for dgram sets whether the server connects to its clients and frees the socket, that's the no wait option, or processes all packets and then times out. That's the wait option. You use the no wait option by default for other socket types. Our INETD file fields continue with user, which is the username used to run the server, and that's usually either root or nobody. Then we have the server name, which is the actual file name of the server, and finally we have parameters, which is essentially everything after the server name. This is where you may indicate the full path to the true target server. And as you know, hash marks denote comments. If you'd like to activate a line that's in your configuration file, you simply remove the hash mark to do so. And as you know, if you make changes to the file, you'll need to restart with something like etsy rc.d init.d followed by inetd space restart or either reload. But instead of using the startup scripts, you can also use the kill or kill all commands. These commands, if you recall, from our run levels and system shutdown and reboot lesson, send the sigup signal. The syntax is kill space dash hup in all capitals followed by the process id or either kill all space dash hup followed by inetd. Security wasn't built into INETD, but can be implemented using the TCP wrappers program, TCPD. The way that it works is, INETD will call TCPD, which checks to see if a client is indeed authorized to access the specified server. And if it is, TCP, and not INETD, will call the server program. You configure the settings for TCP wrappers with the Etsy hosts.allow and hosts.deny files. Allow, of course, lists systems allowed to access the server, and deny will list computers not allowed access. If for some reason a computer ends up being listed in both files, the allow file always takes precedence. The format for entries in these files is daemon list space colon space client list, where daemon list is the list of servers as they appear in Etsy services, and client is a list of computers, either by IP or name, or network with the leading or trailing dot. Let's open a terminal window and see first if we're using INETD, and if we are, we'll take a look at the associated file. Let's open a terminal window, Application, System Tools, Terminal.
is a network scanner. Now another popular network scanner that you might be more familiar with is Nessus. Nessus has the same functionality, but also checks for known vulnerabilities. Nmap scans for open ports on local and other computers. Use the option dash lowercase s capital T to scan for TCP ports and lowercase s capital U to scan for UDP ports. So a typical command might read nmap space dash lowercase s capital T space checkthishost.com. Let's go back to our terminal window and try these out. First I'm going to clear our window with clear. Now to look for all open ports, let's type in netstat, and you should still have root privileges by the way. Let's type in netstat space dash ap and hit enter. Let's scroll back up to the top and you may also want to expand your the size of your window for this output. Now the important columns here are where you see stream which of course is the socket type. This column lists connected and this tells you whether or not the service is connected or you might see listen here. Then you have the port number and the name of the server. And the first one you see here is Evolution, which is the mail client. And if you look, you've got Nautilus, you've got Pulse Audio, and some others. Now let's say we wanted to narrow the search a little bit. We type in netstat space dash ap, and we're going to use the grep command to search. So we're going to add in a pipe, then we're going to type in grep and let's say SQL and hit enter and since it didn't find anything we know that uh, SQL doesn't have an open port currently. Now let's try LSOF. So let's type in LSOF and again we have to have the dash I option and hit enter and in the results we see the name of the server or the command here got DH client, we've got cups and some others, then we've got process ID, we've got the user that's actually running the program, then we've got um, the next important one is type, and then we have node and name. Now again if we wanted to restrict our output here we could include a port number so let's try that. Let's type in LSOF space dash I we're going to do a colon and we're going to try port 25 and hit enter and it came back and told us that we've got uh, send mail here which is for this specific port and as for an nmap I say proceed with caution these types of scanners are used by hackers to try to locate network vulnerabilities and they do so by looking for of course open ports and some organizations may not be too keen on you running this command without prior authorization. So before you test out this command, make sure that you either have permission to do so or that you do it in a controlled test environment. Of course, that may not yield very much information as in our own test systems, but in this instance, it's better to proceed with caution. Okay, so let's head back to our presentation and talk a bit more about configuration files in general. As we've learned throughout all our lessons, programs will have configuration files. So in theory, you could spot unwanted servers by taking a look at your configuration files. Now there are two types of scripts that you should be concerned with. The first, as you already know, are sysv startup scripts. And they exist in directories like etsy rcquestionmark.d or etsy init.d rcquestionmark.d or even at crc.d, rcquestionmark.d. And the question mark, again, refers to the default run level. And we've just learned about super server scripts, which, unlike sysv startup scripts, are only used to launch network servers. You may also want to check out your etsy init tab file, which on some systems started processes used to accept text mode logins or dial-up connections. These processes might be called Getty or MIN Getty, Min Getty. Most modern systems have moved these functions to other files, though. Typically, 
places like Etsy event.d. So most of the time you probably won't need to modify these. After you've identified servers using your configuration files or more likely your network scanning tools, you'll be tempted to want to disable a bunch of servers. Before you do that, I'd recommend that you spend some time researching anything that you don't recognize. You do this so that you don't accidentally disable something that you really need. But chances are you will need to make some changes. And to do that, you've got two options. You can either disable the server via startup script or super server script. With this option, you can easily reactivate the server if you do find that you might need it. Your other option is to remove it completely via the package manager like yum or apt or aptitude on Debian systems. This will reduce the chances that an unwanted server accidentally springs back to life, opening up a security risk. But of course, with this option, it won't be quite so easy to get it back. Still, if you're sure you don't need the server, removing it completely is the preferred choice. Now that we have our server secured, let's move on and talk about host security. Everything we've talked about up to this point largely involves server or network security. But we can't forget about our host security. Each of these systems represents a potential attacker entry point to your network. So we must put just as much energy into securing these systems. One of the easiest things you can do to improve host security is through the use of secure passwords. This is an area where you'll have to set the rules, put faith in your users, and then check up on them periodically to make sure the rules are being enforced. At Global Mantix, one of the first things the new CIO wants to do is to revamp the company's security policy. And as luck would have it, he's a stickler for one of the most obvious but most abused security measures, using strong passwords. What exactly constitutes a strong password? Well, for starters, it shouldn't contain dictionary words or regular, easily recognizable phrases. Also off limits, names or places. A strong password should include numbers, punctuation marks, a mix of upper and lowercase letters. You get the idea, and you can be very creative here. And also, it's configured by default, but you should also use shadow passwords. We talked about these in the user and group accounts lesson. And as no password is totally uncrackable, you should force periodic password changes. And I always say the best defense is to educate your users. Make sure that they know that they should use different passwords for different systems. Tell them about social engineering and phishing, and how an infiltration on their computer could affect the entire network. In addition,
Okay, I've cleared our window, and let's try the command out. Let's type in chage space dash lowercase m, which is going to set the minimum days between password changes. We'll set that for 60. Then we'll do an uppercase m, which sets the maximum days between changes. We'll set that for 75. Then we'll do a dash i, which will set the inactive days or days between password expiration and account disablement. Set that to 5. Then do a dash e, uppercase e, followed by the date, which we'll set to 2011, 01 for the month, and 31 for the day. We'll make this change to the user Nancy and hit enter. Now let's take a look at the listings for Nancy's account by typing in chage space dash l space Nancy. And we see that we have our account expiration date set. We've got the minimum number of days, the maximum number, and we got warning days. These are defaults, things that we don't specify with the command we'll take the defaults. Okay, let's head back to the presentation and talk about ULimit. Nothing irritates network users more than slow or sluggish network response. And we now know how to use PAM to set user and group resource limits to limit this possibility. But there's another command that we can use to set limits for the shell environment. That command is ULimit. And again, this command will only affect Bash and any programs you launch from Bash. The command syntax is ulimit space options followed by the limit. And you can use the dash A option to show your current settings. Additional options include C, which limits the size of core dumps. And you've got F, which limits the size of files created by the shell. N limits the number of open file descriptors. U limits the number of processes a user can run. T limits the CPU time in seconds. And V sets virtual memory available to the shell. Our U limit options continue with dash S, which sets the maximum stack size. Then we have D, which limits the program data set size. And L sets the maximum size that can be locked into memory dash capital H and dash capital S make the other options hard or soft limits. Now switching topics, in many network environments there are probably one or more dedicated servers sitting around that don't have users other than root that need to log in. These systems are good candidates for the Etsy no login file. If this file is in the Etsy directory, only root can log into the system. Other users are just shown the contents of this file if they try to log in. Let's head back to the terminal and try out the ulimit command. Let's go ahead and clear the terminal with clear. Now let's type in ulimit dash t space 50. And again dash t is going to set the limit for the CPU time in seconds and hit enter. Now let's type in ulimit dash a which will show all the settings. And you can see our CPU time setting here for 50. And again this is for bash or, or programs that you launch from bash only. In our lesson on managing user resources with quotas and file permissions we first learned about the SUID and SGID files. These files have settings which tell the system to run the associated program as the file or group owner. But setting a program to run as root poses a security risk. Just think of setting the rm commands SUID as this is a program that's owned by root. If you did so, any user would have the potential to delete the entire directory tree instead of only the files that they own. So it's best to search for any SUID and SGID files periodically. To do this, you use the find command with the option dash PERM, 
and you specify permissions of 6,000, which covers SUID, which if you recall is 4,000, and SGID was 2,000. So the command would read find space forward slash space dash PERM space plus 6,000 space dash type space F. And again, if you recall, the F option says to search for regular files. You could then modify anything that seems out of order. And that concludes our lesson on security administration. Let's review what we've learned on the next slide. This lesson covered an important subject that spans a variety of topics. In truth, security threats, mitigation techniques, and even the tools seem to change on a weekly, if not a daily basis. This is one of those aspects of network administrators' jobs that can be exciting if you're up for the challenge. In this lesson, we began with a general overview of security and moved into a discussion about the Linux Super Server and how it acts as an intermediary between programs and clients. And control by the Etsy hosts allow and deny files provides an extra layer of server security. Then we talked about unused servers and their potential security risk. We learned that while best practices dictate that unused servers should be removed, you should only do so after thoroughly investigating whether or not that server is really needed. We also took a look at configuration files and how they can be used to also identify unused or unneeded servers. We wrapped up with a look at host security, including password rules, resource limits, and another look at permissions. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson.